Well, I think we are right on time. So let's go ahead and get started. By the way, I'm, I'm going to introduce myself, which uh, makes it sort of sound ingratiating, right? I couldn't come up with a bunch of cool things to say about myself. But I, I will tell you that one of the things I'm most proud of is that this is the ninth time I will be speaking at Commodity Classic. Number nine, five in a row. And I, and I tell you, I'm, pr I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> I, I, I hope to make it 10 uh, yet. And <clears throat> so I'm not going to say a lot about myself. I'm at the University of Illinois. I'm a, I'm a crop physiologist. I study high yield systems. I'm going to talk with uh, one, one of you, one of them about you, with you today. I, I also am, am honored to have the Bales with me, both uh, Randy and Brad. I've known them since 2005, and they have adopted on their farm some of the systems that we have developed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with the science of why it should all work, and they're going to be the practical part. And uh, I'm a little nervous because I, uh, I hope they've been successful uh, after, I, after they've adopted all this. So uh, we, we have that to, to see. Um, I'm also proud of the fact, on a personal note, you know, I got uh, uh, three daughters, uh, proud of them, my lovely wife's here. Uh, I live uh, in a small town just outside of Champaign-Urbana called Homer, Illinois. So uh, I have to start off with, uh, with, with uh, another personal note, and, uh, and, and this is sort of a question, uh, and I'm going to tell you that uh, February is my favorite month, uh, and, and you know why? I mean, February wouldn't be most people's favorite month, is my guess, because, but it's my favorite month, and there's six reasons why February is my favorite month. The first one is, I get paid by the month, <laughs> and February is the shortest month. <laughs> but, by the way, today is leap year day, February 29th. This is a day I'm working for free, <laughs> so... Don't say you didn't get something for free today. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I'm not getting paid for this. <clears throat> All right, my other, the other reason I like February is Groundhog Day occurs in February. And who, who doesn't like to have a rodent predict the weather? And you know, you know that the groundhog did not see a shadow. And that means right around an early spring. And as soon as I go back, I'm going to get the plant ready, you know, so, to start planting. I'll tell you another reason I like February, another holiday that I really like, and that's President's Day. I mean, who doesn't like President's Day in honor of our presidents? And, you know, you, you could say what you want about President Trump, but I will tell you that President Trump likes corn. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, another reason that I like February, and, and that is Valentine's Day occurs in February. Well, and, you know, you, I know you guys know Valentine's Day is a tricky holiday for the, for the men. I mean, very tricky. And, and I'm going to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a Valentine's story here, <coughs> briefly. Uh, and there was a guy, and I'm not going to say it was me, but it might have been, <coughs> and the guy wanted to get his wife something really nice for Valentine's Day. So he goes into the jewelry store, he says to the young lady, I want to get my wife something really, really, really nice. Uh, and uh, so she pulls out a, a necklace and some diamond chips in it or something, and she goes, $300. Oh. And so the guy says, well, do, do you have anything that's still really nice but cheaper? <laughs> and so she pulls out a necklace, $100. <laughs> and then the guy says, well, you know, do you have anything that's really you know, not as nice but cheaper? And she took that and showed him a mirror. <laughs> Now, uh, another reason that I like Valentine, or that, I, that, that I like February, is February is the, the month that I met my wife at. My wife's over here, so couldn't have done that with, uh, without her, sir. And then, and then finally, February is usually the month that Commodity Classic occurs. And who doesn't like Commodity Classic? I, I really hope you've enjoyed the, the Classic. I know you got a lot of choice. And, I, and, I t and I'm going to thank you in advance now for choosing to come to this session. So I, I'm going to talk, like I said, I'm going to talk science. And I, and I thought I'd give you a little view of where we do our science. You know, so I, I live in Illinois, 
And Illinois is a long state from uh, north to south. I think it's 350 miles. And then the, uh, the soil types change as you go from the north to the south. So here, here's where we do our research. Most of what I show you, I'll average over the sites, but I'll show you a little bit of it in, individually. And, and I'll tell you how Illinois works. You know, if you're in the north, I mean, look at, look at that organic matter, high, higher CEC, higher levels of base fertility. And as you go to the south, well, the organic matter gets worse and the fertility gets worse. And all you guys from southern Illinois know, there's soil down there somewhere. I'm, I'm not sure where, where they're hiding it. So in Illinois, as you go from north to south, the soil fertility changes. But, so by the way, as you go from south to north, uh, there's more Democrats. <coughs> and I mean, there's a lot of Democrats up here in this area of the state. And if you're from Illinois, you know they can cause a lot of problems. <laughs> but so this is where we do our research. Gives us different soil fertility, different weather. One, one, of the re, one of the ways we try to remove variation is that we use the same research equipment at all sites. We move the equipment. And we have some sweet equipment. I mean, look, here, here's our equipment convoy getting ready to go on the road. We've got the semi-truck with our toolbar. We've got the 450 with our planter and sprayer. We've got, we got fertilizer. We've got seed. I mean, that, that's two million bucks of research equipment. And then I take a 25-year-old and I put him behind the wheel. And I say, uh, be careful. And I think, you know, I was pretty reckless when I was 25. I hope this works out. So, so far, so good. <clears throat> we, we bring everything with us when we go to a site. Everything. We even bring this important piece of equipment. <laughs> because the equipment is powered by diesel. Oh, no. But, and the students are powered by caffeine. And we learned that if you plug that coffee maker into the 12-volt outlet of your 450 truck, it'll spark and smoke, and you'll be ending up with a brand new 450 truck after you burn that one to the ground. Uh, so now, now we bring this generator with us. All right, well, I, I'm gonna, I, I can't resist being an educator, and I'm going to ask you some questions throughout this. And one of my questions is, what management factor has changed the most in the last 50 years? I'm going to make this into a multiple choice question. So I'm going to give you five choices. Which of these has changed the most over the last 50 years? Is it tillage, hybrids, population, fertilizer, or planting date? C. Yeah, see, that's the hint, by the way. What are we talking about here today? The answer is C. And I'm going to prove this to you. I'm going to show you the average planting population in the U.S. over the last 50 years, and I also show you the change in yield in the U.S. over the last 55 years. So what I'm showing you here, this is the average yield of corn in the U.S. in orange, it's a line orange by the way, over the last 55 years, and you see the average yield goes up and down depending on that year's weather. Here's a few weather fiascos. But overall, yield goes up about two bushels per acre per year. And associated with that increase in yield is a linear increase in the number of plants planted. That's the blue line. <clears throat> I want you to harken back to 1965. In 1965, the average yield of the corn in the U.S. was less than 70 bushels, planting less than 20,000 plants per acre. <clears throat> Probably a 40-inch row or a 36-inch row. Who knows? Maybe even some hills. By the way, there were some people that were still planting hills 10 years later, and one of them's right here in the front. I mean... There's Marion Calmer, I'm pretty sure that's before you in, invented the corn head, but he was still planting hills in 1974, 20,000 plants per acre. So now since then, yeah, the yields continue to go up. I mean, now we've more than doubled yield. And last year in the U.S., the planting population was just under 32,000 plants per acre. And guess what? It's only going to go up. It has to go up despite the high seed cost. One of the reasons the plant population is so important to high corn yield is that it is a component of corn yield. I mean, you can make corn yield into a math equation by multiplying the three yield components together. I call this my yield algorithm. I, I don't actually have a clue what an algorithm is, but I think it involves math. So <clears throat> corn yield is a product function of how many plants you have per acre, 
how many kernels you have in every plant, and the weight of each individual kernel. <coughs> and an increase or decrease in any one of those can be responsible for an increase or decrease in yield. And they act at different times in the growth and life of the plant. I mean, plants per acre, that's planting and emergence. Kernels per plant is you know, flowering. And weight per kernel is grain fill. Now, the goal is to increase these. Any one of these increase could increase yield. Sitting here today, which one of these yield components do you have the most control over? Hate to tell you, it's plant population. I mean, you actually have to buy the seed. <clears throat> but that is the yield component that you have the most control over. And because of that, if you look at this blue line, population in the U.S. goes up a little under 400 plants per acre per year. Now, I'm going to guess that most of you are in 30-inch rows. Most corn is in 30-inch rows. And so here's another question for you. <clears throat> What's the maximum population of plants that you can put in a 30-inch row? And of course, the answer is it depends. But there is a top-end population for a 30-inch row. And the answer is... 38,000 plants per acre. That's the top end for a 30-inch row. Now, I, I did the math. I mean, I did the math. If we're at 32,000 plants per acre today, and it goes up 400 plants per acre per year, in 15 years, the U.S. will be at the maximum population for a 30-inch row. And some of you are going to get there sooner. And that means the future of corn has to be narrow rows has to be narrow rows. Now, I'm not sure about some of you. Some of you look pretty old. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but your kid, I, I guarantee you, in the future, is going to be in a narrow row. It's, it, it, it's inevitable. So what I'm showing you here, this is some of our research. I'm showing you 30-inch rows and 20-inch rows. And we plant this with research equipment. So here's our, uh, here's our research planner. It's got a telescoping uh, toolbar. And here we are planting 30-inch rows. There we are planting 20. You can't see it here, but we can side shift that planter so we're not quite in a tire track. <clears throat> that, that means, though, that uh, we can't plant 15-inch rows. Or we can't plant anything narrower than 20. So I'm going to talk to you about 20s. But I'm going to claim, well, with no actual evidence, but I'm going to claim that everything I tell you about 20s also applies to 15s or narrower. It's just with the research equipment I have, we can't plant anything narrower. And, and some people do plant 15-inch rows. Uh, I mean, look at this. This is Marion Calmer again. 1995, 15-inch rows. By the way, that was about 20 years before its time, Marion. So, I mean, he, he's too early on the narrow rows, too late on the, on the hills. So, overall, you got it just right. Um, And then uh, there's Harry Stein. I know you've heard about him in 12-inch in, in rows. I mean, th these guys are visionaries to, uh, to, in order to manage a higher population of plants. And so hopefully what I talk about also would apply to a 15-inch row or a 12-inch row situation. All right, well, back to uh, narrow rows. 20-inch row is the example here. This is out of our research. 44,000 plants per acre, 30-inch row, 20-inch row. There's two advantages of narrow rows. One advantage is, with the same number of plants, you can intercept more early light. I mean, just look at these pictures. This is the same number of plants. And tell me, which side is intercepting more light? Is it A or B? A, B. I'm playing eye doctor here. Which is more light, B, A? <laughs> By the way, if you don't get this right, you either better go, you better go see the eye doctor or move up closer. I mean... <laughs> It's clearly me. This is the same number of plants. And simply by narrowing that row, I can intercept more light. And I'm pretty sure light interception is the whole premise behind agriculture. So that's one advantage. The other advantage is that I can manage a higher density of plants. 44,000 plants per acre in a 30-inch row, they're too close. Look, they're all 4.8 inches apart. Now, I'll tell you on average, each plant needs at least 5.5 inches compared to its next to its neighbor currently. So, and they're too close. But in a 20-inch row, notice it's 7.1 inches apart. So I could manage a higher density of plants. 
So I'll show you a little bit of our research data. Well, actually a lot of data, but I've uh, summarized it down to, down to one slide. And, and I'm going to make this comparison right here. 44,000 in a 30 inch row, 44,000 in a, a 20 inch row, as, as well as some other comparisons in 30. So what I'm showing you here, this is a summary of a lot of data. So 44 commercial hybrids uh, at, uh, at either three or four years at each of these sites. Do the math. 44 hybrids, four years each site. That qualifies as a shitload of data. <clears throat> I mean. So, and I've just averaged it over all the sites here. So what I'm showing you here is 30 inches, 32,000, 38, 44 in a 30-inch row, and then a 20-inch row at 44,000 for each of the locations. And what, what I want you to notice, just look at the average. As you go from 32 to 38, you get an increase in yield. As you go from 38 to 44 in a 30-inch row, you get nothing. But when you go 44 in a, in a 30 to 44 in a 20, 12 bushel yield increase. And by the way, that's true of all the sites. And if I broke it out by years, it would be true of all the years. Now, I'm not going to have time to show you this, but I will tell you that there is hybrid variation in, tw in how they like 20 inch rows. This is 44 hybrids and they vary in how they like 20 inch rows. And I know the question is, you know, how do I know what, what hybrid likes 20 inch rows? Currently hybrids aren't bred for 20 inch rows. Th they will be in the future, but they're not currently. And so, uh, well, we wanted to know what are the plant characteristics that make a hybrid responsive to 20 inch rows? So, I mean, we measured a whole bunch of traits. I think 50 different plant traits we measured. And one of them that we measured was uh, leaves. Uh, you know, remember, it's leaves that intercept light, right? So, we measured the leaves, the angle, the, the width, uh, the thickness. And here we are. I think this is at our northern site. I mean, we have no laboratory there, so we set up right in the, in the field measuring those, uh, those leaves, measuring the weight and the thickness and you name it. And, you know, uh, we're, we're really focused on this. I mean, look at how intent they are. And so they were so intent, they didn't see this cloud right here. And then uh, two minutes after this picture was taken, uh, it looked like that. <clears throat> <laughs> so, the, so the moral of the story is, you know, keep, keep an eye on the sky when you're working outside. <clears throat> all right, well, then, and I, again, I don't have time to show you all the data, but I will. I'll, I'll make a summarization here, and I will tell you that uh, plants that like 20-inch rows have narrow, upright, Leaves. Shocking. <laughs> Who would have thought that that was the plant characteristic? Narrow upright leaves. So I got a picture of it here. I think you could tell me which one is going to like the narrow rows better. <clears throat> and, 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 and along with some other, other traits, but that's the main one. Now, I, uh, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a textbook uh, example. If you read the textbook, you, you learn that narrow rows only work in the north. You know, if you take interstates as a geography, north of I-90, narrow rows work. Between I-80 and I-90, it's a toss-up. South of I-70, narrow rows should not work. That, that's the textbook thinking. And I'm here to tell you, it is absolutely, completely wrong. I mean, I'll, I'll go back here and, uh, and remember that Yorkville's in the north. Harrisburg's in the south, and notice you get the same increase in the north and the south. Why? Why do you suppose narrow rows work as well in the, in the south as they do in the north? Well, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna ask, have to ask you a few more questions to get to this answer. <laughs> but one of the questions that's going to lead to this answer involves the root system. Well, what do you think happens to the size of each plant's root system as you increase the density of plants? As you have more plants on there, out there, what happens to the size of the root system? Hopefully this is a fairly easy question. It gets smaller. I have photographic evidence. Because this is my graduate student's favorite task, digging up roots. Honest to God, there is nothing they would rather do on a cold, wet day than dig up roots. Talk about a good time. I mean, here we are, we're digging up the roots with a shovel. <coughs> And then, then, we're pressure washing them. Look, we got this sweet pressure washer system going. Isn't that look cool? 
Now, I, I want you to take a close look at this picture. Take a close look at this picture here and tell me which one of those is me. I'm the guy taking the picture. <laughs> Sadly, there's an age limit above which you're not allowed to dig and wash roots. <laughs> and I'm above that age limit, so I miss out on all of this fun. Talk about a good time. There's nothing these students would rather be doing <laughs> than digging up roots. <laughs> and so I have photographic evidence that they are distinctly smaller. So again, I'm showing you the size of the root system here. 32,000 plants per acre, 44,000 plants per acre. See, it's distinctly smaller. Now, if you don't believe me that it's smaller, there is a scientific instrument here, an expensive scientific instrument. This is called a rulerometer, and you can actually quantify the horizontal spread of that root system. All right, here's, here's one thing I want you to notice, and use the rulerometer to, to see this. Uh, at 32,000 plants per acre, look at, the, look at the horizontal spread of the root system. The horizontal spread of the root system is only about 7 inches. By the way, roots don't cross the row. I know a few fine ones do, but 95% of the root system is in 7 inches. 7 inches. I know you see pictures of root systems. The, the roots three foot, lo, 3 foot wide, 5 foot deep. Seen that, right? That's called a tree. <laughs> it's not a corn plant. Corn plant root system only goes about seven inches. And that's at 32,000. Once we run the density up, it's even worse. Now, this is a 30 inch row. What, what do you suppose happens to the size of each plant's root system if, if I move from 30 inch row to 20 inch row? It gets bigger. Yes. Again, photographic evidence to demonstrate this. A much wider range of plant populations here as well. So on the top, it's 30-inch rows from 38 to 56,000. And you'll notice they're getting smaller. And at, the, at the bottom is the same populations in 20s. And they definitely get smaller. But at every population, the root system in a 20 is bigger. I, I think it's also a little deeper, too, if you look at the picture. Bigger. Now, th this is the picture, but I, have I can actually quantify this. We've weighed these. So here's the weight of these root systems. So, so again, uh, a pretty aggressive population, 38 to, to 56, 30-inch row, 20-inch row. And this is a whole bunch of hybrids, six hybrids, two locations, two years. I mean, it's not quite a shitload, but it's a lot. <clears throat> and uh, just to make this appear more scientific, and in honor of our Canadian guests, I presented it in grams. <clears throat> so so I, what, what I want you to notice here, at, at, each, at each population, the root system in 20s is bigger. It's somewhere between 20 and 25% bigger. By the way, that's why narrow rows work in the south. Bigger root system. 20 to 25% bigger at every density. Another thing I want you to notice uh, is if you look at the size of the root system at 38,000 in a, in a 30 inch row, it's the same as 44,000 in a 20. See that diagonal? The same thing occurs here. 30,000 in a 44 is the same as 50,000 in a 20. A 20 inch row at every density is like buying the size of the root of 6,000 plants for free. That's another reason that 20-inch rows work everywhere. All right, well, here's the problem we have, right? I've, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure mineral nutrients under the plant are the root. And, what, and, and here's another quandary. As I run the density up and I have uh, smaller root systems, how am I going to ensure that there's adequate new plant nutrition? How are you going to do that? I mean, if the future is more plants, smaller roots, how are you going to make sure they have adequate fertility? Well, the answer is going to be better placement, better source, better time, better rate. And this is suspiciously similar to the four R's. <clears throat> I'm only going to talk about placement. I mean, and, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, if the root only sits in seven inches, 
why would I fertilize the entire soil? Why wouldn't I put the fertilizer where the root is? This is also going to be the future of, of corn production. So we have a uh, research banding toolbar. Here it is. Uh, it's a banding toolbar. It's not a strip-till rig. It's a coulter, but you could do the same thing with a strip-till shank. And what we're doing with this, uh, with this rig is we're banding uh, a, a premium fertilizer four to six inches deep. Tractor's got RTK, so we know exactly where that band is. And then we come back and we plant two inches deep right over the fertilizer band. And when we do this, we see an enormous improvement in the early growth of the crop. By the way, this was the first time that we'd done this. I think this is 2009. So this is the very first time that we ran that toolbar. And I couldn't believe it, I'm telling you. So there's where the toolbar ran through without the fertility. And there's where the toolbar ran through with the fertility. And, and for those of you that are not from uh, I states, this is what soil looks like. I mean, <laughs> this, is a, this is a soil that has 45 parts per million Malik 3P test. So the soil says you don't need any P. Screaming improvement. Every single time. Done it a hundred times since. And have seen that advantage every single time. Apparently, that young plant knows its fertility status from a very early age. And it makes irrevocable growth decisions. I mean, this is the first time I saw it. Uh, this is what it looked like this year. So this is 2019. I think this sucker's planted at the end of June. Um, there's the banded fertility. There's the normal fertility. And the, and the salt test would tell you it's all fine. Screaming improvement. Now here's another thing about, uh, about uh, corn. And if you look at this row pretty carefully, let, let's look down the row uh, at this. Uh, and let's look at uh, the standard row right here. And see right there, see that guy right there? That's a plant left behind. See how he's a little shorter than the others? That's a plant left behind. That's one of the biggest problems that I think you guys face, uh, is a plant left behind. So see this guy right here? This is at standard fertility. He came up two or three days after his neighbor, and he's behind. And I know, you, I know all of these high-yield guys tell you the crop's got to come up at the same time, and they're right. That plant will never catch up to its neighbor. There's not a single thing you can do to that plant to make it catch up. I mean, you can try. You can go out in the field and, uh, and sing to it. You can hug it. Sleep next to it. You can piss on it. <laughs> I've tried it. More than once, just to be sure. And it usually makes it a little worse. I mean, oh. I will guarantee you that that plant has a smaller ear than its neighbors. But when I ban that fertility right under that row, even with, even with more plants, not only are there way less plants left behind, but they grow faster. By the way, this is the same hybrid. Picture taken the same, planted the same day. Picture taken the same day. The only difference is this one has the banded fertility. Again. Young corn plants sense their fertility from a very early age, and it sets the growth and yield potential. It's like taking the dimmer switch in yield and turning it all the way up. Now, I'm not going to tell you that that's going to yield more than that, but it sure sets the stage for it. And as we're running higher densities with smaller roots, uh, it's going to be pretty important to place nutrients closer to the uh, root system. All right, well, one, one last uh, question. And the question is, you know, given all this, if I, uh, if I have a, a, an enhanced management system, so if I use an enhanced system, you know, and I combine management practices like better place fertility, better protection, higher density, my favorite, narrow rows, do, do all these things work together, you know, synergistically as a team? What do you think? Spoiler alert, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. I mean, what, what I'm going to do is I, I'm, I'm going to show you six years worth of data where we compared a standard management practice to the enhanced system. So the standard system is, uh, is an orange. We use the P and K based on a soil test. No sulfur, no micronutrients. 
180 pounds of pre-plant UAN, 32,000 plants per acre, no fungicide, 30 inch rows. I, I hope you, that's like our standard system. And then to that, we had an enhanced system. Regardless of the soil test, um, we used our six favorite nutrients. We banded uh, microessentials SC. You can see the amount of the nutrition we're getting there. And then we broadcast another mosaic product that has, has potassium and boron in it, just, just to give us a, a, an enhanced fertility situation. We also, uh, we also, in addition to that 180 pounds then, we put another 60 pounds side dress. 240 total. Lately, we've been using a Y drop. Putting it, you know, the advantage of a Y drop puts it right next to the plant. <laughs> Again, that's where I'm pretty sure the root is. <clears throat> 44,000 plants per acre of fungicide at flowering, 20 inch rows. That's our high tech system. Now, this is not a recommendation. You know, before you ask me, does this pay? I don't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, I get all this stuff for free. The bales, no. <laughs> And remember, you're getting this day out of me for free. This is the 29th of February. <clears throat> so the bales, I think, are going to talk about whether this pays. But uh, I I'm just going to show you the biological potential to increase yield with this system. And I'm going to tell you, again, I I I've done this six years in a row uh, at the three sites. So I'm going to show you 16 different site years of data. Well, not individually, but I'll average it together. And I will tell you, every single time we do that, we can see it right to the row. So here's the, uh, here's the standard system. There's the high uh, enhanced system. Now, and if we were over here, we'd be standing in there going, oh, this is pretty good looking corn. That's because we don't have that one right next to it. I mean, on average, over the six years, at all the locations, we've seen a 51 bushel increase in yield. 51 bushels, for what it's worth. Now, I'm, I'm showing you, I mean, there's more plants, so I'm showing you the, the, the number and size of the ears, the health of the plant. 51 bushels on average. Now it is true that the advantage of the enhanced system compared to the standard differs according to that year's weather. So what I've done here is I've, I've hashed it out each of the last six years. And I've, I've averaged it over the locations. I mean, it's true at one location in one year, you know, crazy stuff happens. But, but so I've averaged it over the locations to look at the year effect. And so what I'm showing you here, here's year. There's the standard system yield. There's the enhanced system yield. And this triangle, this, this, this puppy's a scientific symbol. That means I subtracted the standard from the enhanced. I mean, you, you could check my math. But on average, 51 bushels. Some years are better than other years. Now, there's one thing I want you to notice here. If you look at the enhanced system, look at the yields in the enhanced system uh, over the years. See how each year, the yield of the enhanced system goes up. Why do you suppose that is? Genetics, yes. That's because each year we use the next best hybrids. And I'm telling you, the genetics change so fast and improve so fast that if you manage them, look at how that yield goes up. Now, overall, it's 51 bushels. Now, here's the, here's the quandary. I got five factors. They give me a 51 bushel increase in yield. Are they each worth 10? Or are some factors worth more than the others? This is a very difficult statistical question. I got five factors. This is like my basketball team of management. Who's the superstar that I have to pay for, regardless of cost? Or better yet, who's the slacker, which means I don't have to pay for it? That is a very difficult statistical question. And in order, in order to answer that question, we came up with a new rendition of an experimental design called an addition omission plot. I know you hate experimental designs, but I'm a glutton for punishment because I'm going to try and explain this to you. <clears throat> so 12 treatments. The blue is the full Monty. It has all five factors. The orange is the standard. And I'm going to compare this to two different basketball teams. So the blue is the pro team. The orange is the high school team. I'll assume the pro team beats the high school team. And then one factor at a time, I take the high school player and replace the pro player with the high school player. And I look at how, how badly that one high school player drags down the performance of those other four pro players. Hence the name omission plot. And I do that for every position. 
And then at the same time, I take one pro player and put the one pro player on the high school team and I look at how well that one pro player can elevate the performance of those other sucky high school players. And I do that for every position. By the way, this would be like if you had five side-by-sides, right? This makes a fantastic visual demonstration in the field because you can see an enormous difference in the appearance of the crop and the yield in a small area. I mean, here's an aerial shot of one of our additional mission plots. I mean, talk about a difference in visual. You can walk these plots. You could root for your favorite factor, which is probably whatever it is you're trying to sell me. But um, it, makes a, it makes a really nice visual demonstration. So what I'm going to show you is if you only did one of these things, which one has the biggest impact? And I'm going to average it over all the sites. It just makes it easier. I mean, again, at a given site, stuff changes depending on the weather. But I'll average it over the, all the sites. So what, I, what I've done here is I've averaged this over the six years, 16 site years. There's the standard yield, 213. And now I'm looking at adding one factor and only one. So I add the extra fertility, I gain 12. If I, uh, if I run the population up to 44,000, <laughs> that's too many plants, I lose one if I don't manage it. You can't, you can't just run the population up, I hate to tell you. If I'm in a 20-inch row, I gain 10 alone. I mean, so, you know, the, 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 the side dress nitrogen worth 10, the fungicide worth 7. By the way, those are heavily influenced by the weather, by whether it was wet or the, and when it was wet. But based, at least four of them are in the right direction, right? So suppose you said, I'm going to use all five, and I want to estimate the, the potential gain in yield if I use all five based on their individual values. So you want to use all five, and you want to estimate it. So you know what I would do is I would add all these up. I'd have to subtract that one. But based on their individual value, you would predict a 38 bushel increase in yield from using all five, but it's really 51. And that means they do work together as a team to support the performance of the other players. All right, well now I'm going to show you the, the high-tech side. What happens if you omit a factor? So remember, you omit one, but you have the other four. All right, so there's the high-tech side, uh, 264, 51 bushels on average. And now I want you to notice that every factor that you admit has a pretty serious decrease in yield. By the way, it's not what you do in a high yield system, it's what you don't do that kills you. Notice if you leave out that fertility, you lose 20 bushels. If you only have 32,000 plants per acre, oh man, they're filled to the tip, they look great, but there's not enough plants, and you lose 19. If you only have a 30 inch row instead of a 20 inch row, you lose 20. See how, see how the magnitude of some of these factors is enhanced in the system? So I, I'm going to compare these here to show you that for some factors, nitrogen and fungicide, the value alone in the standard is the same as the cost of omitting it from the high tech. But other factors, like fertility, especially population and row space, the cost of omitting those is greater. These things work together. These are the three most important things that I see in high yield. It's having more plants and managing them. Managing them by you know, narrowing the rows and making sure they got the fertility that they need. So the future of corn production, in my mind, uh, is, is going to be more plants. And that more plants is going to result in smaller root systems. And that's where narrow rows are going to come in. Narrow rows lead to greater light interception, bigger roots, and they're a fantastic way of having better plant spacing at higher plant populations. Now I also showed you that uh, if you have a systems approach that includes better nutrition, plant protection, more plants, and especially narrow rows, these things work together as part of a team to enhance yield. All right, so I got to end. I got to thank uh, some of the people in my lab. I have a uh, big mouth, but I have virtually no skill otherwise, with, especially with equipment. But, but happily, I have a fantastic team. 
This is this year's team. I, I see some of my former students in the audience as well, so they, even though they're not pictured here, kudos to them for helping us along. These are my current, uh, this is my current research team. In case you missed it, that's me right there. Um, I also, I also want to thank my farm cooperators. So this is where I do my research. Use uh, University of Illinois land in Champaign, but I rent land from farmers at the other sites. And interestingly enough, the University of Illinois charges me to use their land, and they charge me more than the farmers, and they take the grain, uh, which isn't as good a deal, but uh, the university needs the money. Uh, I also want to thank each of these fine companies that have supported my research. They've given me something, seed, product, machinery, money. By the way, if you're a industrial representative and your name's not on this list and you'd like to have it on this list, I can set you up. I mean, I especially want to shout out Calmer Cornheads. They have been a good supporter of my research. They are hosting uh, our, our little presentation today. And finally, um, you know, in advance, I'll, I'll thank Randy and Brad who are, are going to follow me here. I hope they say something good. <laughs> and... Uh, Calmer Cornheads for sponsoring today's session. So we're going to hold the questions to the end. I think we have plenty of time. I'm going to hold the questions to the end, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Randy Bales right now. To get Fred to do his part, <laughs> and I think he's left us a little bit of time here to, to go through this. But. Okay, so we're going to talk about this from a perspective of Fairholmes transition experience. So I'm Randy Bales, as he said. We're from Louisville, Indiana, which is uh, East Central Indiana. I'll show a map here in a minute. But um, so a little bit of my background. Um, my wife's here with me today. We have four children. Three boys and a girl is the youngest. My youngest son is part of the business and um, I went to Purdue and got an undergrad degree there in access and management. And then I've been here working at this farm. I grew up on a farm all my life, but working at this farm for 30 plus years. So I'll start off with something here, just talking about, you know, if you look at that top picture, you know, they're all looking at the maze here, but they really can't see what's going on. So, so they huddle together and you know, come up with a plan and I don't know if Fred's on the bottom or the top here, but um, hopefully we're working together to, to, to be able to make it easier to do some of this work. So a little bit of an outline here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, our farm background, um, some of the cultural practices that we've been involved in over the years, um, some of the research we've done with U of I and, and Fred here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brad to kind of go through the, the conversion that we went through from 20 to 20 inch rows on corn and soybeans. Uh, using a high management systems approach that Fred's kind of mentioned here for us and set us up for. The some 20 to 30 inch row plot we had in 2018, some of the results from that, and then just some general observations of our 20 inch row system. So we're located halfway between Indianapolis and the Indiana state line, right along I-70, which Fred was talking about, you know, it shouldn't work down here where we're at, so we'll see here. Um, here's our farm layout. So farmstead's right here in the middle. Most of our ground's all contiguous here, pretty close together. Um, there's roughly 1,500 acres that we're operating and then another roughly 300 that we're custom farming in that area. Um, so Fairhome Farms, the Drackett family bought the Fairhome Farms, the original 700 acres in 1946. Um, their son, Kim Drackett, came back to the farm in 1997 and started operating the farm and managing it. Uh, Ron Olson is our uh, uh, agronomist that we work with and he, at the time in 1986 when we started working with him, he was in the soil testing business. He went on then to work for Cargill and Mosaic as research agronomist. And that's kind of the connection we got between him and Fred when Mosaic was doing some work with Fred um, that put us there. And we continue to work with Ron. He's retired now from Mosaic, but we continue to work as a, with an agronomist. Uh, myself, I started at the farm in 1986. Um, and then Brad joined the farm in 2016. And then last year, um, we um, started a new entity called Fairhome Ag that I am the owner of. So through a transition of Kim's and retirement, 
Um, I bought the uh, operating assets, the equipment. He still owns the land, so I'm renting that ground off of him and have started actually operating myself, but 30 plus years here on this farm. Cultural practices, back in 1985, Kim started ridge tilling. Before that, it was all conventional till. Uh, 1994, we started no-till. Uh, grid sampling goes back to the 50s with Kim's dad on a two and a half acre grid. In 1997, we started, um, went to a one acre grid, uh, sampling every six years. Um, I've been working with variable rate fertilizer with the local co-op since 1988, and then some of it we've transitioned to doing ourselves. Variable rate seeding since 1996. First yield monitor in 1993. I actually have this yield map from 1992 from a neighbor um, that came and ran a few acres on us with that prototype yield map. So come a long ways on back then there was no GPS, it was all done dead reckoning. Uh, so there were some issues there with where the dots actually went. And, and then we've been working with RTK guidance since 2010. Um, went to implement guidance in 2016 so that we could um, apply anhydrous ammonia relatively close to coming back and planting. So we was putting the anhydrous on, then we could move over the half the distance and plant right between without having to wait the normal time to be able to do that. So that, that was the main reasoning that we kind of went that route. Been working with cover crops since 2014, and then we switched to 20 inch rows in 2017, so we've had three years of 20 inch rows. Some of the research we've been involved in, um, back in the late 90s, we was involved in a project with the uh, United Soybean Board and the University of Illinois on the grid sampling, and that's where when we kind of transitioned based on some of that data to the one acre grids. Um, did some variable rate nitrogen work and Fred was involved in part of this in 2005 to 2007. Um, University of Illinois and Fred had an actual twin row plot on our farm in 2010, looking at the narrow rows or the twin rows in 30s. Currently, we're involved in a project with Soil Health Partnership since 2017 on a cover crop versus non-cover crop strips. And then our current kind of research is since 2017, we've been working with um, narrow row corn, 20 inch row system, um, trying to get that to work and, and based off of a lot of the research that Fred, Fred just went through earlier. So I'll turn it over to Brad to, to, to go through kind of the transition. He was highly involved in making this change and um, researching the equipment that we would need and putting that together and he, he's the key person on, on getting a lot of these plots put in and um, operating the equipment. Okay, so my name's Brad. I came onto the farm in 2016, like he said. So I, I think I get the fun part of the talk here because Fred can talk to us and tell us all these numbers and all these plots that he's put in gets 50 bushels, but does it really work on the farm? So we converted 2017 to 20 inch rows, which involves, as you would know, a complete change in our line of equipment. So starting off with the planter, we went with the horse. It's a 40 foot, 24 row, 20 inch planter. It, we went the horse, it's a very simple design for a high speed planter. There are no speed belts, there's nothing. It's just the, a high speed meter, electric drive, comes standard with hydraulic downforce, all the bells and whistles you could want on a planter, standard on a horse planter. Next thing we needed would be a strip till bar to be able to band fertilizer. So this is a custom bar we built, put together. Has a Salford tank, uh, Eulary coulters and row cleaners and stuff. We'll get actually into the design of the actual row unit here in a minute. Next thing you need, corn head. So we had to trade in our 30 inch row corn head. As you saw in the picture, we changed over to track tractors. Part of the reasoning for that with 20 inch rows, you're not working with a lot of space between the rows. We have 16 inch tracks on one tractor, 18 inch tracks on the other. So when you're running that small of a space, Tracks give you a lot more surface area, a lot better traction. And we also had to up the horsepower from the tractors we had before to go with the strip tool bar and the planter themselves. Next thing would be a Hagee sprayer we got for uh, Y dropping. 
and our fungicide work. So we went from having co-op hired aerial application of fungicide to be able to do that all ourselves now on this high management 20 inch system. So we feel, as Fred kind of talked about, that this narrow road transition is a high management systems approach. So following Fred's emission plots, you can't just add small pieces to make the narrow systems work as a whole. It's an addition of everything together. So this here is our strip tilt toolbar. In the front, we've got row cleaners to kind of clear a path and warm up. We're banding mez just like Fred is. It's about four inches deep with this coulter here. And then we have, its I like to call it a modified rotary hoe in the back. Originally, we had some slabbing problems with this coulter and a little wet. So we added this here to try and even up our seed bed, make it a little nicer to plant in. Split ni nitrogen application. So we were actually putting anhydrous pre-plant, pre have a little bit of nitrogen with our mez, a little bit with our planter. And then everyone asks, can you drive a Hagee down 20 inch rows? You can drive a Hagee down 20 inch rows. A lot of times we're wide dropping eight to 10 mile an hour. I told Fred the other day, we had some rain coming in last summer. I was wide dropping at 13 mile an hour trying to get in ahead of it. So it is possible. So, and then also fungicide, which we're also doing with our Hagees. Something Fred asked us the other day, do you see your 20 inch corn being taller than 30 inch corn? We do. We were spraying fungicide on corn that is taller than our Hagee. It's a lot of times taller than the boom, but it works and we've had great success with it. So then seeding rates. We went from 34,000 to 44, or 40,000 average seeding rate on our farm. And hybrid selection. So we believe this is one of the biggest points and we'll talk about it again later, but as Fred said, narrow upright leaves like the 20 inch system a lot better than a lot of the other hybrids do. So in 2018, we planted a 20 versus 30 plot on our farm as a comparison. So this is comparing what would have been our normal production system. So we were seeding around 33,000. Side dress 28, we VRT broadcast as our P and K. And then over on the 20 inch side, we upped it to 40,000 pre-planned anhydrous. VRT banded P with the Mosaic Mez product. And then we VRT broadcasted our K. This year, normally in our 30 inch system, we wouldn't have done the Y drop fungicide, but this year we did, and it, it was applied on both. So now the real, does it work? Fred really wants to know this. So our, in this plot itself, we had a nine and a half bushel advantage to the 20 inch row system. Another point of it, our 20 inch corn was almost a point drier in moisture at harvest. All the way through this season, you could see it in the field, the 20 inch corn was a whole growth stage ahead of 30 inch corn, same hybrid, planted the exact same day, so same ground conditions. Other parts of the results, we had a higher return, about $20 per acre net income advantage to the 20 inch rows with the additional yield, less drying due to the lower moisture, and that's including the difference in the cost of inputs to put in the plot in the two different populations. So our observations from the 20 inch row system, we took and compared our yield against the county average for 14, 15, 16 would have been the three years prior to switching to 20 inch rows. 17, 18, 19 would have been our first three years in 20 inch rows. We saw a 20 bushel advantage over the county average from what we were before to what we are now in 20 inch row system. It also applies on beans. So before switching to 20 inch rows, we were on 15 inch beans. And then we switched to 20s. And there's about two and a half, three bushel advantage there in beans also in the system. So as I said, corn gets a quicker start. This would be a picture over here. This would have been more of our standard system. This is the high management system on this side. You see there's almost a growth stage ahead advantage in planting. Some of you might see this row right here that looks a little funny. That is where our banding toolbar was plugged and that row didn't get the banded fertilizer. So that single row right there in multiple fields in same pattern all the way across the farm 
was the growth stage behind the entire year. So since then, we put a monitoring system, so now we know if a row is blocked on our dry toolbar. So corn canopy is quicker, more lighter interception in a 20-inch row. Hybrid selection is very important. So less than 50% of our hybrids that we had in 30-inch rows transitioned well to 20-inch rows. So hybrid selection has become very important. Last year, we put out a plot with 30 different hybrids in it trying to find the 20 inch row hybrids. This year we're gonna do that again. It's critical. You can't get this data hardly very well from uh, breeders. And a lot of it too, the management system itself, not just the 20 inch rows, corn responds differently to the management separately from 20 inch rows itself. So we, the other thing we've seen, lodging becomes less of an issue in the higher populations. That comes back to that root size. So planting 38,000 in 30 inch rows compared to 44,000 in 20 inch rows, we do see that stand is a lot better long term. So that's all I have really. This is something that we believe in. This is something we think is going to work. That's why we've taken the time and made the investment in this equipment and this management practices. So I think now we'll open up here with Fred for any questions anyone has. Yeah, so uh, now's our, I think we saved a few minutes, oddly enough. <clears throat> Anybody, uh, who has a first question for, for us? Yes, sir. Uh, I see you mentioned swing row 30. What happened to that? Fred's failure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the question is uh, twin row 30. Um, you guys know this. Man, we love twin rows too. We were jaded by failure. And uh, the, the problem we got into, twin rows worked extremely well at low densities. But when we ran the density up, the lower leaves fired up and the crop fell down, and it was uh, holding temperature. We were holding the temperature at night. The, I, I don't, you know, we don't have the data to show it to you, but it was about two degrees hotter down the twin at night. And empirically, every August day that it's above 73, you're going to lose a bushel. And, and we just got too hot. So we abandoned that. Now, I, I've seen great twin rows in the north, and I've seen people with good twin rows, but we couldn't make it work. Anything, anything to add? Yes, sir. The nitrogen we're putting on with your Hagee, how narrow of rows are you putting, or tires do you have on that Hagee? So his question is how narrow our tires are on our Hagee. So we actually have a 22-inch tram that we're running down, and we have, uh, they're 320 tires, so they're about 12 and a half inches wide. No, we are driving in the Y-drop and fungicide application. Yes, sir. Do Y-drop every row in the twins or every other? Every other. So his question was, do we Y-drop every row? So we were actually set up on 40 inches. So each row has one tube along it rather than two. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I think the question was something about, do I think the 20-inch rows will work in the south where it's even hotter, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, we've measured the temperature in 20-inch rows and 30-inch rows, and there's no difference. If anything, the 20-inch row tends, trends toward being a little cooler because it closes the canopy and then sort of shades the ground. So when sunlight hits the ground, it really warms it up. I mean, I, I, I'll let the, the bales talk about this, but uh, what I see in our research is after you have a small rain, the, 20, the soil in the 20 stays wetter longer than the soil in the 30. And I think it's because the, the sun's not hitting the ground and evaporating it. Have you seen the same thing? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yes? All right, yeah, so the question, and I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Brad answer this as well. The question is, uh, how much is too much? Um, so the answer always is it depends on the moisture. It depends on the fertilizer source. That uh, uh, MAP, or Micro Essentials SE, it's not very salty. And you could put an enormous amount of it in there. You, you'll notice both of us are broadcasting our potassium because that's the, that's the product that gets a little salty. I believe both of us have coulter systems. Right. And so it stratifies a little bit of the fertilizer in the seed furrow. I mean, um, I, I'm going to guess 
that would have no problem whatsoever putting 200 to 50 to 300 pounds of mess in the, in the, in the band. And if you had a shank, you could go a lot higher. Right. right. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're running the Coulter system and, and looking in the trench after it's applied, it, it's a gradient through the trench. You've got a little bit running about two inches deep and then a, most of it sitting in the bottom, hopefully close to four inches deep. We haven't seen any salt issues. Like you said, Mez, the salt index is fairly low on. We haven't tried running any nitrogen in our strip till yet. We're talking ESN, possibly something like that. We think urea is probably too salty, but yeah. Another comment, Brad, just a second. Yep. So another comment there with 20-inch rows versus 30-inch rows, you've got more rows linked in that. So so same rate, rate in 30-inch rows is less than it is in 20-inch rows. Yeah, good point. Thank you. for In the back. If I'd have been smart, I would have handed this gentleman the mic. But I'll, so I'll paraphrase. <laughs> um, he's, he's pointing out that he's in South Central Kansas in 15 inch rows, and the crop is substantially cooler. Uh, I believe you said five degrees cooler. And and I and I think that uh, he's agreeing with us that that by by closing that canopy, you're you're shading the ground, and it's keeping it cooler. And and as a result of that, since he has warm nights, he's seeing a two point higher a two-point increase in test weight. So that, that would be indicative of the fact that the narrow rows might have an additional advantage by, by not heating up the ground and keeping the crop cooler. So I, uh, I, I thank you very much for that observation. That, that, uh, that's music to my ears. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the gentleman's comment is 22-inch rows, sugar beet land, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as he pushes the population, he has, uh, has um, uh, standability, standability issues, correct? Um, so I'm going I'm to let the bales answer this because I don't know the answer. But I'll, <laughs> I'll speculate, I'll speculate that, that this is a situation where the hybrid selection is exceedingly important. And... and um, Brad didn't mention it. He mentioned that he looked at a lot of hybrids, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that only about a third of the ones you looked at are really tolerant to 20-inch rows. Correct? Yeah, probably. So I, I'm guessing, it, I'm guessing it's a hybrid deal. Randy, would you have a comment? Well, yeah, just maybe from our observations. You know, when we were putting plots in 30-inch rows at the 38,000 or whatever, they would always lodge in the fall. But we weren't doing the full system. We didn't have the mez, the fertilizer underneath it in the band. We weren't doing as much fungicide work, you know. So that's where I come to the it, 
from our situation and observations, it's a whole system. When we're planning now 44,000 in these 20 inch rows, we have not seen the lodging that we were seeing at even 36 or 38,000 in some of our plot work we were doing um, in the 30 inch rows. So I attribute it part to, to being a whole systems approach. You gotta have all the pieces there like Fred's emission plot. If you, if you lose some of them, that's where you start losing, whether it's from lodging or whatever the problem is. You know, and that's where I see, you know, I've looked at some of the other university data, you know, Purdue really hasn't seen an advantage to 20 inch rows. But I think they're looking only at 20 inch rows, not looking at the whole system is our philosophy or, and that's where, you know, we think you have to do the whole system. You can't do part of it because like Fred showed you, there's big losses. Excellent answer, Randy. You think I would have come up with that, or I should have? <laughs> I should have come up with that over here, and then I'll come back Fr to you. Fred's yeah. got us brainwashed. Yeah. <laughs> are you using a single disc coulter to put that fertilizer down, and are, is that a yeah? It's a single single coulter with a side knife on it. There was one over here. And you still have the problems. Well, the only thing we're leaving out, we haven't done the fungicide. Yeah, okay. So keeping that plant green longer in the season <clears throat> helps with any root diseases. You know, that, that's, that's a big part of it, I think, also. Yeah, that's the, the, if you, it, it, when we spray the fungicide, the lower leaves stay greener longer, and it's the lower leaves that feed the stalk on the root. So sometimes that can have a huge improvement in the standability, wouldn't you and, say? And maybe that's, you know, part from our 30 intro system when we was doing it before, we wasn't using near as much fungicide. You know, fungicide is a standard portion of our program now. Yes, sir. How many applications of fungicide are you using? We're, we're currently only using one at tassel or shortly, you know, brown silk. Yeah, and I would say if you're going to use a fungicide, that's the time to do it. Yes, yeah. and that's yeah. what undercover. I think is the question. Oh no, no not we're, no. We're just spraying over the top. Fungicides yeah. over the top. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. We've noticed the uh, cooler canopy temperatures also by five six degrees just by using a temperature gun. Uh, and we thought that we might be dragged down because of the evening heat would not dissipate nearly as quickly. But um, it's kept our yields up 20, 20 bushel an acre, 20, 30 bushel an acre above the county average, and we're corn on corn. Wow. So I, I think the common denominator here is it's the soil that's absorbing the heat and staying warm at night, not necessarily the plant. For the guy that was asking about the lodging, you know, we get storms, and that was one thing that was a real, a real changer for us. We always worried about green snap because we get storms, we get hellacious winds, in the wrong period of time, certain maturities, we had green snap issues. But it seemed like on our on our 15 inch rows, we had such a much stronger, healthier stock that we didn't, we don't hardly worry about that. We don't see it anymore. Thank you for those comments. Other questions? I know we're a little over time. I know you got a lot of stuff to do. But I would heavily encourage you to go up down to Calmer's booth and get some brochures on narrow row heads. And I'm going to go out on a limb uh, myself and say he'll give you a 15% discount if you, if you buy a, uh, a head today. So I, I, that, that's on me, Marion. I, there was one more question that I'll take, and then, by the way, I, we're going to hang around here if you've got an individual question, and I'm going to be in uh, Calmer Corn Booth as well. I'll let this gentleman ask the last question. What do you say about the population? You're at like 44,000, and a lot of these seed reps are saying that for every 1,000 seeds we plant, we ought to be getting... X number of bushels. So here at 44, you're not producing 440 bushels. So what do you say about the populations? That one's yours, guys. <laughs> Go right ahead, Fred. You're the scientist. I mean, you did the math, right? You worked that seed cost into your, into your $20 estimate. 
So yeah, we're seeing advantage now. What yield we should be getting per thousand? I I can't give you that number, but you know, there's there's a lot of things that has to come together to make that I think come true. Well, once again, I know you had a choice. Thank you so much for choosing this session. Enjoy the rest of your time at Commodity. Uh, don't forget to fill out the survey. You know, hopefully you enjoyed and learned from this session. And they take that survey super serious, so please fill that out. Hope to see you at the booth. Enjoy the rest of the time.